to start off, uh, it's Sharon Bira who has arranged the whole thing. Hello. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm Sharon Bira. I've spoken to some of you all email. Thank you very much for coming. Um, your chairman, Henrik Overgaard Nielsen, who happens to be my husband, but there's the sort of reason he's the chairman. Um, he's the chairman because he was the co-chairman of the Danish No Movement, Univivazen, and ran the 1993 campaign, was also very um, involved in the 92 campaign where we won, of course, in Denmark, the Maastricht Treaty. So he has quite a lot of experience in chairing meetings like this. Um, this um, has been put together um, as a training day under the auspices of the Democracy Movement, sorry, Democracy Alliance, which includes the Democracy Movement, CAFE, and uh, Bruges Group, and <coughs> excuse me, and Global Britain. And these groups are, they form, we're a forum for historical proven Brexit groups. It's simply a forum for us to come together and talk and try to form some sort of influence, if we possibly can, on the Electoral Commission when they're deciding which no movement to make the official no movement out of the two that are existing at the moment. And uh, obviously there's quite a lot going on in that area, which we won't talk about at the moment. Um, we do ask that you keep to time. Any questions, please write down on the question sheet you've got at the back of your piece of paper on the chairs and hand those to me or to Laura at the back and then the chairman will coordinate those questions and they will all be asked at the end of session at seven. So, hope you enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much. Now, just, just a, a little note. Um, questions, we are not expecting questions uh, during the, the, the speakers. Uh, the only questions I will allow will be questions of understanding. If there's anything you're not sure about understanding that's fine. I do not want any political questions, and I do not, and that brings this for the whole day, I do not want any political statements either. Today is about listening to the speakers. It is not about listening to yourself, okay? Just to make that absolutely clear. Our first speaker is John Boyd, who probably most of you will know. John is uh, chairman uh, or secretary of the uh, Campaign Against Eurofederalism and Chairman of the European Alliance of EU Skeptical Movements team. Uh, he's also currently writing a series, How the EU Operates, uh, for the Morning Star. So obviously, uh, he is the, uh, the chosen person to do the first session, which is, how does the EU actually work? You should have had a handout or two pieces of paper from John uh, on a handout. Uh, if you haven't got them, then let us know. But apart from that, uh, we're very well welcome to John Boyd. Thank you. <coughs> right, you should have one sheet, not two at the moment. Oh, sorry. Um, we'll get the second sheet handed out. Now, you can either do uh, PowerPoint to death, or we can have handouts. The object of giving you the handout is you can take it away and study it afterwards, and that's your homework. There'll be no handing it back in and marking, but uh, hopefully you'll study it afterwards. Now, the EU, or the continent of Europe, is what we should be talking about, not Europe. I won't have people saying Europe because that's uh, a propaganda victory for the European Union and its advocates. So it's either the continent of Europe or the EU. The EU is a huge, huge subject, and I'm only touching on one part of it. I've been writing about it for, uh, must be 50 years, and studying it and campaigning it. And it was in 1992 that we set up team, and my organisation was at that counter-summit in Edinburgh, where we supported the Danish People's Movement, and we've helped each other since. So there's history there, which I won't talk about too much. So I'd like you to look at this first diagram. Now, it may look like a circuit diagram because I am an electrical engineer, but it's not a circuit diagram, and I'm not going to talk about every nook and cranny in it, just the main institutions. Otherwise, we'd need a fortnight's course, not a 40-minute talk. Now... I'm going to deal with the main aspects of this. The, this is the way the European Union presents itself. And 
they present it as though we're at the bottom as the electorate, that we send people to the European Parliament, and I'll talk about the European Parliament in a minute, and we vote in MPs who then form a national government, and it's the Prime Minister that has <coughs> the patronage to form a cabinet. We don't elect actually the government. It's only the political parties and MPs that are elected. Uh, and the monarch invites the Prime Minister to form the government. So that feeds into uh, the diagram from the bottom. And the same with the other 27 other nation states, other member states, I should say. Now, the got the line across the middle there, which feeds into the top part of the <coughs> setup. The commission at the top, on the left, is the executive and the legislature. That is the executive and the legislature. That is the thing that governs us. And they govern us at the moment according to the latest treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, plus the treaty for the functioning of the EU. And it's wrong for Cameron to have pinched the discussion to talk about reforms. We should be talking about the Lisbon Treaty. It's the Lisbon Treaty we need to chuck out. And I keep saying that everywhere, and it must be taken up by the Leave camp. If you're not taking it up, then you've trapped into talking about these silly reforms whereas red and yellow cards, and we should show him the red card to get off the pitch and let us talk about the Lisbon Treaty, which is very serious matter. It's the Lisbon Treaty which we have to chuck out, and it's the Lisbon Treaty by which this has been developed and formulated and all the rest of it. Now on the right there at the top is the European Council, and that is government ministers who go to the European Council, the summits are, which is just another meeting, are the Prime Ministers and Presidents and so on, etc. Now, they can meet as the Agricultural Ministers, the Ministers for Fisheries, ECOFIN is the Finance, etc. and so on. So that is, is at the top, and that's presented as though it's um, where everything is decided. Now, in the Council, European Council of Ministers, the European Council of Ministers votes by qualified majority voting, in which Britain has only 12.6% of the votes. It's not very powerful. Germany has more, France has more, um, somebody else, I've got the list here, France and Germany have more votes. Now if you think about it, Britain has 12.6% of the votes. <coughs> if you come from Malta and you're the Maltese Prime Minister, you have 0.08% of the votes. Now it's hardly worth putting on your hat to go to a meeting in Brussels to the council ministers. Now a lot of the other small countries have very small votes. Now to get a majority decision at the European Council, you have to get 16 other member states to support you. That's why Cameron is going around all the capitals trying to garner support. But he's not going to the tiddly countries, he's going to the big ones to persuade them to vote on his side to support him. You also have to get, it's a double majority, you also have to get 55% of the population of the EU as well as the 16 member states. It's a double majority. Most decisions now since the Lisbon Treaty and since this QM, latest QMV was put in place in October last year is the way they vote. And they vote in secret. Now it's sort of made out that they're making all the decisions and so on. The Commission votes by majority votes by majority decisions, they're in secret, they're not elected, they are not accountable to anybody, 
they are the legislature and the executive. So that's the top there. One of the most important committees just underneath the European Council is CORIPA. CORIPA is a permanent committee of ambassadors from all the 28 member states. And they decide the agendas which are discussed by the European Council. And if the CORIPA agrees something, then it goes forward to the European Council to be rubber stamped. The ministers don't know what decisions or what it's about. The other list is where they can't agree. If they can't agree, then it goes on to the agenda of the European Council. They discuss it. So if it's fisheries, say, they can't agree, then it goes to the summit. So that's the sort of uh, route for the decisions. Now, Coriport is virtually unknown. I've debated twice with a member, an ambassador, former ambassador to Coriper. The first time, I nearly won the vote at a school. The second time, he would only give his Christian name. He wouldn't even give his surname. And somebody had knocked him about somewhere because he didn't want his name known and linked with Coriper. So that's Coriper. Now you can see there are a lot of other things around here. The other important one is the European Central Bank. The European Central Bank is made up of governors and so on of national member states' banks in the Eurozone. Now you can imagine that the bankers there are not exactly working class, they're bankers. And they control uh, all sorts of things. I think there's the other institution we need to look at is the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice is made up of 28 <coughs> judges. Some of them aren't even judges. And that's where a member state can take a problem and decide in secret what to decide. And that court has come out against, from a trade union point of view, against collective bargaining and solidly for the free movement of labour. And it's the free movement of labour which should be of great concern to the labour movement. And that's my constituency. And they take decisions. You can't appeal against them, etc. and so on. And one instance of that is the Viking Ferries some years ago, where the Viking Ferry Company sacked its Finnish sailors and employed Latvian sailors at half the price. That is the free movement of labour, and the European Court of Justice came out in favour of that. There are other uh, uh, cases and so on and so forth which you can look up. And you can look at a lot of this stuff on our website at cave.org org.uk, if you take a note of that, there are 600 pages of information from a labour movement perspective. And a lot of what I'm saying today is on there. Now on the right there, which is also little known, is the European Military Committee. Now lots of people say, well, the, the EU hasn't got a military aspect. It does. It has a European uh, military committee, and they are the chiefs which go from member states to that committee. There are photographs of them. It's they who, their Euro Corps and so on, which raises the flag outside the European Parliament. So they're obvious and so on, and the European Corps and so on are active in Africa. They're active in Somalia, in the Congo, and other parts of Africa. And if you think of it in a different way, forces from the EU, either as NATO or as individual member states, have gone in and smashed up the Middle East. It's the forces from the EU which has created the problems which now have come home to roost in the form of mass immigration from the Middle East and so on. And they haven't solved it, and I don't think they will, in a humane manner. So I think they're the major sort of institutions, and if Laura could hand out the other um, hand.
find out. We'll have a look at that. Now, on the right of this diagram one, you've got an economic and social committee, which has, I think it's 230 members of a committee. You can imagine that a committee of 230 people is completely <coughs> unmanageable. Um, but they break it down into different interest groups. Now, in this committee, there are the transnational corporations, trade unions, and other groups which come across the EU, from across the EU. So that's that committee is the one that is used as a conduit to pass down the legislation to trade unions via the European Trade Union Council to TUCs and the trade unions. Now if you look at diagram number two, as I've said on the left, top left there, the commission is responsible to nobody. Its decisions are made by a simple majority, they're made in secret, and if you look at the commission, who's on the commission, you'll find bankers and transnational corporation people who were, prime ministers from right-wing governments and all the rest of it. If you remember that uh, Cameron wanted Lord Hill to be the president of the EU Commission. Now Lord Hill is a banker. Cameron wanted him in there as the president to defend the interests of the banking sector in the City of London. So he's a banker. He's not anything to do with us, especially nothing to do with people like myself who've worked for their living. If you look at the Commission, they're made up of all those sort of people plus um, former Prime Ministers and so on. Juncker is the former Prime Minister of Luxembourg, a right wing, mm. etc. And he is the one that junks things. He, he's, Juncker is very appropriate. Um, now the Commission can pass across to the Council of Ministers packages, policies and draft directives on what the EU Commission wants to happen. So they can kick it around and decide and support it and kick it back again. So there are common policies which derive from this two-way situation and from other committees down below. And it's those directives which become the legislation. Now the legislation is decided by the Commission. The European Parliament down the bottom left has no powers. It cannot raise taxes, it can't raise an army, it can't raise a police force, it can't write a budget. It has no real powers. It's got a little bit more powers since the Lisbon Treaty came into place. It can sack the whole Commission, but it can't have anything to do with electing or appointing commissioners. So the European Parliament is virtually a toothless institution. And my organisation has always called for a boycott of the European Parliament elections because it's a fraud. It used to be called an assembly, and that's what it really is. The name was changed in 1986 with a single European Act which laid the basis for the single European Parliament. So I don't go on, and I'm sorry if there's MEPs here, but I don't go anything on the European Parliament. And I vowed to stay out of that building, and I did have the beginnings of an opportunity to be an MEP, and I have stamped on it as hard as I could. Because it's a fraud, and it's the institution which is always put up as the democratic face of the EU. When you look at any treaty, it's the first institution in the treaty. It's the first institution, if I can find it, 
in things like this commission document, how the European Union works. It's the first institution in there, and it then gives the impression, well, the EU must be democratic. There is no democracy in the EU. It's the antithesis of democracy. So if we go around some of these other things, um, as I've said, Coripol under the European Council takes or gives the European Council of Ministers its agenda. So that's <coughs> not democratic. There's no input from us up to Coripol. There's no input from us to the European Council of Ministers except via the ministers that go from Britain. But when the Lisbon Treaty was put in place, it changed the whole EU from an intergovernmental arrangement into a union. And it made us all subjects, and it made the ministers responsible for running the EU. Not their own governments, or responsible to their own governments, but to run the EU as a union. That is important to put across when you're talking about these things. So, the European Court of Justice sits on its own and its decisions can be passed down to uh, governments and parliaments. So it overrides all national governments and all parliaments. And there's no appeal against their decisions. And the European Court of Justice can, in fact, impose fines on member states. And it has done so with Britain. If we go to the left under the European, the ECB, that is, as I said, unaccountable to anybody. It uses the complicated qualified majority voting system within the Eurozone, and there are different systems of voting. The European Central Bank is unaccountable, and it passes down the monetary and economic policies and dictates in regard to the Stability and Growth Pact. Now, Britain is in line with the European Stability and Growth Pact, when the Labour government came in, it uh, knocked the economy and so on to take account of and be obeying the Maastricht criteria for the single currency. So although Britain is not in the single currency, we obey the single currency rules. And in the treaties, every member, every member state is due to join the single currency at some point. And there are people in the European movement who want Britain to join the single currency. I mean, it's lunacy if anybody thinks about it. And there are people I've come across and spoken against who say Britain should join the single currency. It's sheer madness. But we obey the Maastricht criteria on limits on public sector spending, and government borrowing. That is where it comes from. The European Commission can decide directives and it passes it down to the governments and say, this is a directive, directives have to be carried out. Now the only directive number I could ever remember is 91 stroke 440, which is to have competition on the railways. Now, competition means privatisation. Hence, under the Maastricht Treaty and the strict amount you can spend on the public services, that is behind all the privatisation of all the old public services and so on. They've sold them off to uh, agree with the Maastricht criteria. So these things are passed down from the Commission as directives and legislation. And most legislation going through the House of Commons is secondary from the EU. It's not discussed or debated. The, the, there is a, a select committee on Europe um, 
which does discuss it. Sometimes it might get onto the floor of the house, and sometimes it might need not. But a lot of legislation comes from the EU via the Parliament, another conduit, without being discussed by MPs and Lords and so on. So that is um, where all this stuff comes from. That includes austerity. The aus policies on austerity are based on the Maastricht criteria and so on and directives. That is where austerity comes from and austerity stems from Brussels. Because if you think about it, it's a common policy across the EU and Greece has been the worst case for austerity being imposed on a country, a member state, via these criteria and so on. If we go to the right hand side again, the Economic and Social Committee. The Economic and Social Committee is the way it is used to push what is called Social Europe. Social Europe is a complete myth. It does not exist. And Social Europe came about when Jacques Delors went to the Danish, Irish and British TUCs and said, look, I'll give you Social Europe, I'll give you a social charter, providing you support European Union. So they did. There was no discussion at the British TUC, I don't know about the Danish or the Irish TUCs, but the British TUCs just went flip-flop on this question and did not debate it with its members. They weren't mandated to discuss it, etc. And that's the root of the so-called social Europe. It was a charter, and then it was turned into a chapter at the end of the Maastricht Treaty. And then it gets a bit more promoted as called Social Europe in the Lisbon Treaty. So it's the social Europe which is used to hoodwink British trade unions and other trade unions in other country to support the EU. It's done a good job. It's done a bad job from our point of view, and that is what the trade union movement here is besotted with or is blinded to the actual effects of the EU itself. It's social Europe that they keep clinging to, and as I've said, <coughs> the European Court of Justice have said you can't have collective bargaining, you can't have anything against the free movement of labour, and it's the free movement of labour which is causing a lot of problems here amongst workers up and down the country. And they're getting, what should we say, pissed off with it. And they're going back to their unions and say, you've got to do something about this. And it's that that we have to, to try and break. So there are things aside from the diagram. Now the Commission has a commissioner of trade and she is debating with her counterpart in the United States over TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Package Partnership. And Brian Denny, a mate of mine, is talking about that this afternoon. But it's the Trade Commissioner, the European Commission, is keeping this all secret. They won't let us look at it. They won't let MEPs look at it. They won't even let ministers from member states look at this uh, negotiation which is ready for signing or on the way to signing unless we stop it. And I'm sure Brian will talk about that a lot more this afternoon. So th there are the main elements of how the European Union operates, who's got the powers, who decides and how. Now you can see that it's the European Union presents the one that looks like democracy, but the real thing is the second diagram. Who has the powers? We have no channels to affect the Commission or the European Council of Ministers. There's no good lobbying Westminster about privatisation of railways, 
or the postal services. You have to go to Brussels to do it. And it's no good going to the European Parliament because it has no powers. So it's that sort of thing which has culled our normal acceptance of what democracy is. There is no democracy between nation states. There is only democracy within them. And if you take away the powers of national governments and we've taken our sovereignty away, then you've culled democracy, national democracy. That's the way they've done it. So we're going to end up with a buildings at Westminster which are a shell in which MPs sit down and discuss things but they're losing their powers. They've lost many powers since we've been in the EU. It's all gradual and so on and so forth. And that is how the EU, the European Union, has got away with democracy. Now what aren't on these diagrams are the lobbyists. The lobbyists are those who represent, in the main, transnational corporations. And it's the European Round Table of Industrialists, which is the main lobby group. And it's the ERT, the European Round Table of Industrialists, who draft, in fact, the treaties. They just pass them to commission. We would like this. They're the powerful group behind the EU and behind the Commission and so on. It's kept out of view, but it's the European Round Table of Industrialists and another one called, I've forgotten what it's called now. There is another group which is smaller, which deals with financial sector. But they're the groups in Brussels with thousands of lobbyists going round the Commission buildings, going round these committees, even going to the European Parliament, although this hasn't got much power, to convince people this is what we want. The head of Fiat some years ago said, if you don't have a single market, we'll do it. That's the top of a big multinational company, Fiat, and others have joined in and they've formed the European Round Table of Industrialists. They meet two days before every meeting of the Council of Ministers, because that's the way they influence. They get the ministers and say, this is what we want. If you don't do it, we'll do it another way. That is important from a, a class point of view, and understanding who is behind the European Union. It's not democratic. It is completely an, the antithesis of democracy and nation states. Nation states are not an anachronism of the 19th century. They are important. That's the way the world operates now and each nation state, including Britain, should have the right to self-determination, national democracy and national independence. And that's the basis of my organisation, etc. And that's why I'm prepared to stand on platforms, including Nigel Farage in Manchester, to say these things, because that's our constituency, is the most important things are the nation-state and the right to self-determination, national independence and democracy. I'll stop there, because that gives the chairman three minutes, or for somebody to throw a brick at me. <laughs> so, Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. I have to say that was utterly depressing, but very informative. Um, if I can start off with the first question then, uh, John. I seem to remember from the old days that it was only the Commission that could initiate laws in the EU. Is that still the case? Yes. yes. That was a quick answer. Uh, any other questions? Yes, the gentleman down there. Uh, the European Court of Justice, 28 members. Who appoints the members of the European Court of Justice? The national government, member state governments. There's a lot of horse trading. You can imagine there's horse trading about who's going to be a commissioner and the European Court of Justice. 
some of them aren't even judges. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think Harry first. Yeah. Um, how do we find out who the members are of the European Round Table of Industrialists? It's, it's on a very good website called uh, European Observatory. You could pick it up off our website. They've done an awful lot of work. They have a very good picture with, you know, outside the Barleymont building, which is the, you know, the commission building, with all the flags of all the different countries. Well, somebody's replaced them with the flags of the transnational corporations. That is what it is. They've done an awful lot of work on it, and it's very detailed work. And you, there is a list and you can get the, the list off their own website, ERT's website, if you they want. They have their own website. They have their own website, and they boast all sorts of things. Fantastic. Yes, gentlemen there. Uh, where does the, you know, just look at your chart, the United Nations Economic Commission Europe and all the global bodies that are actually setting the actual rules that the EU is translating, does, does that fit into your thinking? Because actually the bulk of single market regulations increasingly now are coming from global bodies like UNIS, Codex, Basel Banking Committee, which informs the European Central Bank. But that would be the lobbying. I mean, they, they set the rules. Yes. Well, the European Commission sits on the World Trade Organization, etc. It's, it's, um, I don't know the precise details of that. I haven't studied that. But I can well understand that... Uh, somehow the Commission will obey the rules and regulations of these standards. I mean, I'm an engineer and I know there are inter international standards and European standards, which are important, because if you're building an aircraft, uh, you build one bit in one country and another bit in another country, you've got to make sure you're using the right system. There is a joke that one country was building the body uh, of the aircraft according to inches, which is Britain, and Spain was building it according to centimetres, <laughs> so they didn't fit together because they were the wrong size. I mean, it's, I agree with standards, but we don't need a big block to impose standards. That's part of internationalism. It, it should be international. There was an international, or is, an international postal service, etc. You don't need a block to run it. You need nation states to run these things. Thank you very much.